Guess what time it is, Crystal. What time is it? You know what you need to do. It is time for Metaphysical Corner. 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 Slash. Corner. corner. Spirit pop. Paranormal. <laughs> Paranormal. Paranormal. Slash. Par Spirit pop. Paranormal. Yes. This is the segment of our podcast where we just talk about spiritual things, kind of geek out on maybe if there's any spiritual news, and also talk about things that we're interested in. So what is on the Metaphysical Corner Rasta, Brian? Well, did you hear, or rather did you see, that a UFO was spotted flying over the Ukraine a few days ago? I did. I saw that in a YouTube video, and I looked at that video with my eyes, and I thought to myself, wow, that would be so easy to Photoshop, though, really. And I asked myself, can we trust any of these videos on YouTube of UFOs and craft? I mean, is any of it real anymore? There's so much fakery that it is hard to discern. But at the same time, Brian, I 100% believe that it is possible that there's some interdimensional or alien interaction, especially around wartime nuclear plants, nuclear missile silos. I mean, that has been historically reported as being true anyway. And with what's going on with Russia and Ukraine, it just makes sense that maybe we've got some aliens overseeing things. What did you think of the video? Of course, the believer in me is like, oh, wow, this is fascinating. But as I'm watching it, I'm like, it's just so easy to fake. And it was also a video of a video. So they were recording like a YouTube or something like that. And I know some of it's because they're saying that social media is kind of getting blacked out now over there. They're limiting Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all that. But you're showing me a video of a video. Was this a <laughs> self-produced video? Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel like it was not legit. But I do feel energetically that there is interdimensional traveling happening around Russia and Ukraine, right? especially Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I didn't like when I sit and try to tune into it. I don't feel it as much around Russia as I feel it's sort of centered around Ukraine right now. Right. Um, but I do feel like that there is a lot of interdimensional um, energy afoot. Indeed, and it would make sense that there would be craft or UFOs around Ukraine because, of course, I think Russia did something to their nuclear silo, right? Or their, yeah. <clears throat> what is yeah. that called? They, a, a nuclear plant? Like, <laughs> Whatever yeah. it was. Yeah. I think they, they, I don't know if they bombed it. I don't think they bombed it, but they did something. They attacked it. Well, they, some... they took it over. I mean, they have control of it. Oh, they do see. I don't even know. I don't even know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they have control of it now. I'm so disturbed by all of it that I have a very, I, I can only hear highlights that aren't so bad for my husband every now and then. I like, I don't pay attention to that stuff because it's so terrible other than to pray and to have a vision yeah. about it, which I do do. Yeah. But yeah, so that's probably why they would be around because the nuclear stuff is in play. And I think that we've always had interdimensional and alien visitations. I think it's quite possible that we've had panspermia. We've had, um, we've had interdimensionals here helping to seed our planet and maybe even our ethnicities and our different helping us to develop and to become more enlightened. I think that that's quite possible. But once we detonated the first nuclear bomb back in the 40s, I guess it was, that's when we start having these types of visitations. For example, Roswell. Roswell is a, a case where there was allegedly a UFO that was downed and they recovered an alien or two, although that story has changed so many times. But they, yeah. they definitely found parts of a craft, allegedly. And after that, you see a lot of these stories. <clears throat> Sorry. After that, you see a lot of these stories of UFOs. And UFOs have developed. They used to be flying saucers. Now they're triangles. Now they're different things. But I think they've been around since we started playing with nuclear stuff. And so it makes yeah. perfect sense to me that they may be there. I'm not saying they are, and I don't think that that video is accurate, but we could use all the help that we can get. The question is, are they good aliens or are they bad aliens? Well, you know, um, I think it's Stephen Greer who always says that they're all good. There's there's absolutely no bad. Hogwash. And 
Yeah, and, and we, we kind of, you know, call shenanigans, hogwashy shenanigans on that. Um, and then there are people that say there are good ones, bad ones. There are many different races, if you will, or species of, you know, aliens, extraterrestrials, interdimensionals, whatever. And that, yes, yeah, some are good, some are great, and some are just evil, you know, to the core. And, you know, there are people that believe that there are very evil ones that have infiltrated our government, our banking, and, and different, you know, key things that keep, you know, things moving. So it's just, it's such a fascinating conversation to think that there's so much more going on than just simple people living on the earth and going through what we go through, that there are other forces at play. Yes, and I actually pulled up an article because I mentioned couple of weeks ago about um, missiles being deactivated. And I said it was yeah. in New Mexico or Colorado. I was wrong. It was Montana. Um, but I did look it up and I will read you a little bit of what the article says. UFOs, this is, uh, by the way, this is the U.S. Sun. UFOs allegedly shut down 10 nuclear missiles in a bizarre incident at a U.S. military base and the global phenomena may have been triggered by the first atomic bomb tests in the 40s, it has been claimed. Strange objects in the sky are under intense focus as the U.S. releases intelligence reports ordered by the Congress on the issue after a flurry of leaked videos. The article points to the incredible tale of Captain Robert Salas, a former U.S. nuclear launch officer who went public with an extraordinary claim stating, in 1967, a UFO appeared at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. Salas claims that 10 of the U.S.'s nuclear Minuteman missiles that he was overseeing inexplicably moved into the no-go setting, meaning they could not be launched even if the order was given. The base allegedly took a day to bring the weapons back online, and they could not find any physical damage or explanation for the sudden problem with the missiles. And uh, So I got a bit of that story wrong, and I'd just like to correct it, because I said I, th I thought that they were active, and then they were deactivated, but they were just switched from whatever, I'm sure they weren't active, into a no-go position. Like st maybe stand by into a no-go. Maybe. maybe. Yeah, maybe. Okay. So oh. that's an interesting, and uh. I think that, like I said, I think there are reports of craft around nuclear facilities, nuclear missiles, and I mean, I want to believe that they would help us. I want to believe that they would deter World War Three, but I'm also... I'm of the mind that we have free will and we're here as a collective humanity consciousness. We are here as a collective to figure it out and to do it of our own accord and to choose the way of unity and harmony. So it's, it's like if they do stuff, I don't know how much they can do because I think it's up to us to resolve this. You know, stop being such warring, crazy, uh, competitive greedy beings and instead work in harmony with the earth and with each other and we just haven't figured that out yet and we're no. we're on the precipice of nuking ourselves into oblivion yeah. and i don't think i don't think i'll see it in my lifetime yeah that that unity that even even a, a even a, a sort of uptick toward it i just i don't feel i don't feel yeah and i think that i think we're incarnated now on the planet to do what we can as individuals to shift it and to bring light. And the more of us that connect spiritually, I do believe this, the more of us that connect spiritually and that expand our awareness and our consciousness, the more we bring people with us because it's like a magnet. So the more enlightened people you're around, the more enlightened you become. So I think we're on this planet now to kind of grid and anchor in enlightenment, light, and a higher vibration so that we can help the current change and move in a different direction. And you're right, we might not see that in this century or even next century, but we're here right now just holding the line, if you will. And yeah. for folks like me, like this is what I do, you know, 100% of the time I, I talk about metaphysics and spirituality. Like I hope that this is making some kind of a shift and a difference or opening up minds for people but like i mean i don't know you know it's, is it a voice oh, in the you wilderness are. you're absolutely no you are because i have gained so much spiritually from our association you know from from Same. then to Me now too. i i learned eh, 
but um but i, I learn a whole you're lot so and, self-deprecating and it, you're so ridiculous i have i have you are you are ridiculous. that's why you people, are. but i think that what you're saying like i think people think they're not making a difference and that means they don't try to make a difference when in reality when you know the kind of difference you can make just by being pono as we call it in hawaii solid grounded light bearer way shower when you know that that you can do that and actually make a change that's when people get turned on and activated and the change starts to happen, yeah. right? So that's what yeah. Gandhi was talking about when he said, be the change you seek in the world. So you do make an impact on me. And, and it's I'm, I'm not trying to make this about me and what I'm doing out here, but I'm, I understand the importance of it. But it's like that saying, and I'm going to mangle it. Um, oh, I forget. It's, it's like the, the man, the old man doesn't plant the tree to enjoy its shade. He plants the tree for his grandson to enjoy the shade or for the next generation to enjoy the the shade. And that's what I think we're doing. We're planting the trees and we might not be able to sit in the high vibe shade of it all, but we're doing something to contribute. But if the aliens want to throw us a bone, Brian, I'm 100% here for that. Please, please, absolutely, (laughs) all day, every day. We'll take it. We we are planting the seeds for the future generations spiritually. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love that. I Hmm. love it as well. Well, let's totally switch gears here. (laughs) Yes. Away from the aliens in Ukraine and talk about sleep paralysis. Yes, absolutely. And recurring dreams. You know why I want to do that is because I am currently in my Light Shine Academies Intuitive Intensive. This is a program we run every single year. It is our cornerstone program. It is so good. And we just got off of dream week. So we talked about dream work. We talked about dream journals. We talked about lucid dreaming and OBEs and how to do all those things. And afterwards, I had a QA and a with the students. And they just asked such great questions. I love it. But one woman said, what about recurrent dreams? Like I've been having the same dream all of my life. Why does that happen? And so I wanted to ask you whether you've ever had a recurrent dream. For a long time when I was young, I, I had a recurring dream that there was a, a figure kind of cloaked, no eyes, just, just sort of an indent where the eyes would be, no real nose, no real mouth, and I would be running circles around my house. And at one point I would run around and it would be there and it would stop me and it would say things to me like obviously without using them telepathically and i never got the message it was like i could see it happening and i knew i was dreaming but i could never like i knew in the dream portion of what i was watching there was communication but i was never able to get what it was trying to say to me so when was the last time you had that dream oh mercy probably 1992 Okay. So I guess I got whatever Hmm. I got out of it, but it, but it was, yeah. I mean, nothing now in my life is ever a recurrent dream. I just usually have a dream there. There may be a theme or two. What about places? Do you ever return to the same place in your dreams? Yes. Me too. Yes. I do too. I, 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 um, often return to the home that I grew up in, Mm -hmm. which is weird because I, I never thought I had any type of emotional right. attachment to it. And when my parents moved 10, 12 years ago into the house they have now, I immediately took to its energy and felt more at home there than even I did in the house that I grew up in. But considering I'd also, you know, left that house in my early 20s. So, you know, I, I didn't, and I'm going to go back and visit, but I hadn't lived there in a long time. So I don't know, it's very weird, but I, I never ever have had a dream about the house my parents well my mom's gone now but that they moved into well even though i love that house more as a spiritual person i would ask you was there some kind of a trauma that happened in that first house was there some kind of because when trauma happens to someone they literally shed a part of themselves in that moment and that moment is kind of stuck in time and there's a magnetism to that this is why people who get traumatized and hurt end up being quite dysfunctional because their energy was so rearranged in that moment and the energy was also dropped there shed there and so we can be as a soul drawn back into those places and spaces through the cord of the trauma so i mean i know the answer to this i know Mm -hmm. that there was some trauma for you there so that might be 
what, and it might be something that's seeking to be healed in you presently, which is the reason you go back to that place in your dreams, yeah. if that and makes you know, sense. It's weird. I don't dream of the inside of the home anymore. Now it has shifted to the outside. Hmm. Interesting. And it's and the house isn't the well, when I was dreaming of the inside, it wasn't even the same. It was such a different layout. And everything was just it's all jumbled and weird and, and what we've talked about, you know, what that could be, um, the difference in space. But um but now it, like the last time I dreamt of it was probably three years ago. And I was sitting on a car outside of the house across the street having a conversation with someone who i i don't know who they were but in the dream they were like a friend thinking it could be a guide perhaps and we were sort of talking about the house almost as if it was there but not Interesting. so it was so detached and i almost felt like i wasn't really there hmm. and i kind of knew i was dreaming about it it's so weird but it's been a few years since i've had that wow well so many layers to the dreams. I had a recurring dream as a child that really, really scared me. Well, I had two recurring dreams. I'll start with the one that didn't scare me. I had a dream that I was a little girl on a boat. I was probably about eight, nine, or 10. And I would start dreaming this when I was much younger than that. And I don't know that I was fishing, but I was out on a boat on a lake and I could see the shore and I could see the trees and I could see a man there. And I think that was my father. But in my dream, it wasn't my actual dad. It was a different man. That's, that I used to have all the time. The second dream I had, which was the one that scared me because I didn't understand it, was uh, I was always in a swimming pool. I was in a body of water in a swimming pool. And I lived in Kahala at the time on Oahu. And we lived in like townhomes and they had like a community pool. And that's where I would go to the pool. And that's the pool I would dream about. And I would be treading water in the pool when all of a sudden I became aware of a presence beneath me and I would look down and there was this just yawning black void beginning to rise. And I, and then I realized that it was a whale, a black whale starting to rise beneath me. And I'm a little kid just treading water and I would get so scary as it's emerging, beginning to crest. And then I would wake myself up now. I dreamt about that for many years, but I stopped dreaming about that as an adult. The first dream, I actually think, the one where I'm in the boat on a lake looking at the man, I think that's a past life memory. And I think as children, we have a lot of these past life memories. We probably dream them. Some of us actually consciously remember them until about five, six, or seven, and that stuff starts to fade, except through dreams. I think that was probably me, a glimpse of a life that I had before. The whale dream is deeper than that because water is emotionality in the dream state. And the whale is also significant in its own energies and properties. But to me, it represents the emerging subconscious, what's coming out from beneath the water, and which is enormous, you know, so enormous that I feel like I might be taken over by it. Because of course, at that time as a child, I'm living in a house where there's violence, I'm living in a house where there's trauma. And I'm also thinking that this represents the stuff I brought into this life from before, like the stuff in my subconscious, which I have to deal with, which I have to deal with, and that which is seeking to be witnessed and become conscious to, even as a child. And that's why I was scared of it, because I didn't know how to become conscious to what it wanted to talk to me about. But as I got older and started working with trauma, working with my soul, my timeline, that resolved and I don't have that dream anymore. But I do believe recurring dreams are happening because they're trying to help us remember something from a previous life or something before, or they're trying to teach us something. And until we learn that lesson, we're gonna to continue to have that dream. So how would we go about sort of facing the dream, if you will, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, digging out the knowledge or the lesson that we need to identify and work with? Well, my answer is always going to be asking God for help <laughs> because the stuff I don't understand in this life, which is legion, like there's a lot that I don't understand in this life and the things that I want to do in my life that I don't know how to create for myself. I always take that into a partnership moment with spirit, like through meditation, do I ask? And I am a, big believer and I've seen it 
to be true that if you ask, the answer will be given if you know how to look for the answer and if you're paying attention. And so I would ask spirit to reveal to me the deeper meanings beneath these dreams so that I can become conscious to the meaning. I would also work with a specific exercise that I taught my students just this last week, which is a really, well, I think Trisha did, um, which is a a really cool way to work with dreams, which is once you've had a dream and you've remembered it and it's still fresh in your mind, so do it right in the morning, condense the dream down to one paragraph. Like don't, not two or three pages, just one paragraph that describes the dream, making sure to include all the symbolism present. Write it down and then once you have it written down, go back to the paragraph and select which words are the symbols. For me on the boat, it might be boat, it might be lake, it might be father. If I'm looking at my whale dream, it might be whale, it might be void, it might be water, pool. Now once you've identified all of the symbols, what you want to then do is interpret each symbol for yourself. And so if it's boat, well, what does a boat represent to me? And here's the thing. Most people will get on the Google and look up dream interpretation for boat. That doesn't work because the meaning for boat for you is different than the meaning for boat for me. It's your subconscious and conscious talking to you. So what does boat mean for you? And then I would move to lake and then I would move to father and I would sub out my interpretation for boat with the word boat. So I'm sitting on a boat would become I'm sitting on a support or I'm sitting on I don't know what my I would have to think about boat as I'm thinking about what is my interpretation for father and I am looking at my father becomes and I am looking at paternal protective energy or a, a person who loves me, a person who protects me. And I would I would remove father and I would sub in my interpretation. And then when you do that with the whole paragraph, read the paragraph over because the message is inside of it. Right? That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah so that's absolutely. That's a great way to break down your dreams. And anyone who has spiritual dreams or they wake up with a sense of, wow, that was a meaningful dream, I'm not sure why, you should do that exercise because you will learn a lot about yourself. Brian. There you go. A lesson here in the metaphysical. We love a lesson. Now, I did say we were going to talk about sleep paralysis to kind of switch gears again. Yes. Because another student brought up that they had experienced sleep paralysis and became aware of an entity uh, in the space when she was paralyzed and why that was. And so I was wondering to start, have you ever experienced sleep paralysis? I did. So this was about... 15, well, I've had it a couple of times since, but this particular one was interesting because I was working with tone frequencies and theta waves and, and, and beta waves. And I was just trying to do some meditation with those playing over headset. And I was in bed and I was just laying down and I was having the experience to where I popped out of my body and I was down, looking at myself laying there doing this and something grabbed a hold of me and yanked me. And when it yanked me, I popped back into my body and then fell on the floor. Okay. Now, could that be I jerked, you know what I mean? And, Mm -hmm. you know, or was it that I wasn't very good at getting back in? Maybe it just was like a rough landing, but I saw, I saw like handy claw thing come up at me and it, it was from the side of the bed, but I don't think it was under the bed. It just was sort of there. And I only caught a glimpse of it because I was more fascinated with the fact that I'm out and I'm watching myself and I'm like, this is fascinating. I'm, I'm literally floating here looking at myself. And, and it was just such a weird ethereal moment because the only way to describe it, it, it's, it was kind of like I was floating, but looking down at myself, it was like I was I was so cognizant of you know the way my because I had hair at the time, I, the way my <laughs> hair was, and the way you know the look of my face and the fibers and the comforter that I was laying mm-hmm. on top of. I was just so aware of all the little details, and I was thinking like this is fascinating. And then I see this thing happen, and I immediately you know dove right back in. So I don't know what that actual moment was of getting pulled but I was on the floor and I'm like how the hell did that happen 
Well, so let's talk about sleep paralysis a little bit. Uh, Robert Monroe, who's the grandfather of the out-of-body experience, and of course he founded the Monroe Institute, and he wrote uh, Journeys Out of the Body, and I always point over there. That's my bookshelf. Um, he wrote uh, Far Journeys and uh, some other books, but he's a classic reference and resource for astral projection and out-of-body experiences. Anyway, he describes sleep paralysis as body asleep, mind awake. So your body is completely asleep while your mind is awake. But the question becomes, where? what is it awake in in terms of dimensionality? Now, a doctor, if you were having sleep paralysis and you went to a physician, the doctor would say, oh, don't worry about that. That's common. You will hallucinate. Don't. It's not real. No problems. This is natural. A metaphysician such as myself would tell you, well, that's, uh, it is natural, but it isn't necessary. I don't believe it's necessarily a hallucination. I think what happens is when your mind is awake and body is asleep, your mind is tethered to 3D reality still, but it is also dwelling in 4D. It is also dwelling in that outer dimension that we've spoken about a few times. And this is the domain of the earthbound spirit. This is the domain of the dreamer, the recently deceased. There's a lot of weird activity that is happening in the fourth dimension. And you are tethered to 3D, aware of 3D, but you're looking, you're looking with your observation, your spiritual eyes into 4D. And I believe something kind of happens, like an energetic wobble happens where, first of all, people start freaking out because they can't move. And that's a fear response. And the fourth dimension is a thought reality. So if you lead that experience with fear, then you're going to start attracting fearful experiences and in specific fearful entities, which is why so many people experience shadow beings or aliens and have alien abductions in a state of sleep paralysis and profound fear. Also, I think there's like a little beacon, <laughs> there's like a little flare we send up into the world of spirit that says, hey, she's tethered to her 3D body, she's, she's paralyzed, she's afraid, and then the grodies start to come out. The grodies notice you and, you know, that, that scene, I think it was Insidious when he's got the lantern and he's walking through, is it, no, it's yes. not, is it Insidious? Yeah, right. He's, he's walking through the house in the right. dream state, and you could see all that. Yeah. Right, and so it's, he's like holding that light, and they can all kind of see him. It's sort of like that. So I, the antidote to sleep paralysis is to try to get yourself out of that. Well, but sleep paralysis is the precursor to an out-of-body experience. There's a wonderful book called Soul Traveler by Albert Taylor. He was a former scientist for NASA. So a very logical mind, but all his life, all he did was have out-of-body experiences. And he too would sense a presence while he was having out-of-body experiences. And his grandmother told him that he was riding with a witch and that what he was sensing was a witch. And so he had all this fear about having an OBE until he started to work with it and develop it. But when he realized that paralysis was just the step right before leaving his body, then he calmed down and he allowed his light body to detach and then would have these intentional experiences. But what Albert discovered in terms of an entity or a sense of a presence was he actually turned around and he looked to see who the entity was and it was him. It was a higher or higher, a different version of him. And here's where it starts to get so cosmic, Brian, because as I've stated previously, there's a, there's a light body for you in every dimension. You exist already in every dimension. And when you pop into 5D, you're like slipping into the vehicle that exists there for you to navigate. So his entity was actually a different version, a different dimensional version of him that was always with him. And maybe the consciousness attached to the light vehicle that he was in as he was having this experience. Is, is that crazy? Am I making you crazy right now? No, no, this is fascinating. <laughs> So, this is absolutely fascinating. And I read another book by Dr. Mitchell Gibson, a physician. It's called Your Immortal Body of Light. I have to say it that way when I tell people about it. Your Immortal Body of Light. And Dr. Gibson was a meditator. He just meditated, loved to meditate, and he would have all these experiences. But at some point, he began to be aware of a presence with him as he meditated and as he went on his different journeys. And long story short, he was actually being accompanied by, I say Thoth, you know, the Egyptian yes, messenger. Yes. God, but I know it's not pronounced that way, so excuse me. Um, he became aware of Thoth. And as it turns out, he's from 
the soul group of Thoth. And he is actually a version of Thoth in this incarnation. So it's actually him as an ascended master. His version existing in 5D or 6D or wherever Thoth lives is, that's him. And so he's being attended by himself, but in an ascended master form. It's a radical book. You should read it. It's really, really good. That is fascinating. But back to sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis is just the step right before you leave your body. But it can be very scary, especially if you go into it with a fear response. The only thing that has ever worked for me to break sleep paralysis is the name of Jesus. And I don't know why. And it's actually documented, well-documented that this is what works. Now, some people try to just move their finger. If I could just move my finger, then I can break the paralysis and that can work too. But for me, if I find myself in a situation, I try to say the word Jesus. And as soon as I do, boom, I'm out of paralysis. So for anyone- So are you back in, in this reality or are you out of body at that point? Both. Like when you say Jesus, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. And, and actually when I'm saying it, it's that- garbled like I'm at the bottom of a thousand wells Jeez. because I'm huh. saying it in the astral and I'm trying to say it in the physical I'm trying to wake myself up so you're saying it in the astral until you finally say it in the physical okay. I remember being in bed with my boyfriend many years ago and I was having an out-of-body experience that was scary and I could see him in the bed next to me and I was yelling at him to wake me up. Wake me up because something was coming through the doors into my bedroom. Wake me up. And I was screaming so loud in the astral that the physical started to do the same. And I finally said, wake me up. And I woke up. So wow. kind of like that, but um, it can be hard to actually say the word. I'm not sure to just think the word works, really. I think you have to say it. So I'm just going to offer that because I know a lot of people actually experience this and are terrified by it. Yeah. So that's fascinating. Yeah, mm. we kind of we kind of talked about a lot of different things. We talked about UFOs though for Ukraine. We talked about recurring dreams and how to interpret them, and then we talked about some of the sleep paralysis stuff. But it's yeah, fun. I've, 